You know, after seeing a lot of bad writing recently, and living in this crazy world that we call reality, and editing three books simultaneously, and struggling with all the other first world problems that make my life a living meme, I really need a pick-me-up. I need a feel-good story. And so, that's what I'm going to talk about today. How to write a feel-good story. Hi there everyone, Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. Feel good stories are such an interesting thing because there is truly no shortage of stories that exist to make us feel warm and fuzzy inside and grin from ear to ear and restore our faith in humanity and the world in general. But despite this continuously spewing fountain of Hallmark films and just honestly good things happening in and around your life every day, way too many of us say we want something Meteor. <laughs> and not as in the meteor coming down from the earth, but we want something nice, meaty, juicy, and filled with protein. We want stories that drag us on emotional coaster rides. Or we want to just turn off our brains and just exist. Or we want a story to pump us full of entertaining adrenaline. Or we just want a story to eat up our time. And then we tend to say in these times that we'll just bypass feel-good stories. We, who needs them? That's like cotton candy. But then one day we stumble across a feel-good story, we read it or watch it, and then we question why we haven't had more of this goodness in our lives. Because seriously, we kind of need it. We writers should give more consideration to feel-good stories. Because they are healing to the soul and actually kind of challenging to write. Much like writing short stories or novellas, learning how to do more with less is a fantastic exercise for authors. So, how do we write these beautiful gems of spiritual and emotional rejuvenation? How do we get countless people within the audience to beam with contentedness and happiness? Well, I have found two main formulas for developing feel-good stories. Formula number one, someone has a good life, which is suddenly taken from them or is challenged in some kind of way, and they must restore what was taken or they have to overcome the challenge that they've come across in their happy life. It kind of feels like the hero's journey, but a feel-good story can be easily overtaken just by sheer epicness. So in this case, it's kept really simple. The second formula is a character starts off with a bad or hard life, and through a series of events they find greater happiness. And there we have it right here. Now, <laughs> like I said, it's kind of simple, at least on the surface. But there are a few important rules to both formulas. Rule number one, a feel-good story is often crafted in its simplicity. Just like I've said, if you add too much to a feel-good story, it can easily swing into becoming something else, like a rom-com, a drama, a fantasy, or an adventure. Now, the first formula that I said, where it's basically the hero's journey, uh, is supposed to be stripped down to its absolute barest bones, focusing purely on on how goodness overcomes whatever the problem within the story is. And I'll have some examples to help illustrate this here in a bit. But let's now look at the next rule for writing feel-good stories. So rule number two, the amount of negativity within the problem or the challenge that the hero faces, whether it be a villain or a weakness or just something bad happening in their life, this negativity cannot be greater than the amount of goodness that should be within the story. In fact, writing the two, negativity and positivity, in equal proportions might be brushing up too close to any other genre. The reason for this is that a feel-good story stresses that goodness, whether it be coming from the hero or from humanity, from faith, from God, from magic, whatever, it's that the goodness is what overcomes all problems. If we don't see that narrative throughout, the ending will just simply be cathartic. Catharsis is nice and all, but a feeling of relief and closure is not the same as feeling generally good and renewed. And finally, while showing that goodness can overcome all problems, if you make it too fluffy and sweet, it can become overbearing or lose its sense of direction. A feel-good story has to balance goodness with its opposite, while still tilting the scales towards goodness. And trust me, that is no easy task. 
Now, let's have a look at some examples. Of course, if you want some great feel-good stories, there are tons of episodes from old TV shows that are honestly great. You also have some really amazing sitcoms from the 90s and the early 2000s, and the entire Hallmark Channel to boot, along with some classic Disney movies. However, I will say this, not all Disney movies, especially the classics, are actually feel-good stories. Feel-good subplots and messages can most definitely exist within a larger story, like Pinocchio, and no, I'm not talking about the new Pinocchio, yeesh, uh, but also, uh, <laughs> we have the story of Kaladin confronting his depression in the Stormlight Archive, or we have a great little story like Littlefoot realizing that he's found a second family, and Giselle coming to terms with the nature of Happily Ever After. But those little subplots of feel-goodness never take center stage within the larger story of the Stormlight Archive, or Enchanted, or The Land Before Time, or even Pinocchio. So a great point of comparison actually then within Disney movies would be actually to look at Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs versus Sleeping Beauty. Snow White is a great movie where good triumphs over evil and true love conquers all. However, the story is far more fairy tale like than anything else. Darkness and evil overshadowed the whole story, mingled with humor and beautiful set pieces and amazing music. Love and goodness are undertones to all of it, but they aren't actively trumping wickedness and Snow White's predicaments. Instead, it turns out to be the solution at the end of the story. On the other hand, Sleeping Beauty begins with a glorious celebration for Aurora's birthday, which is then overshadowed by Maleficent arriving and cursing the baby girl. But as the good fairies demonstrate, kindness, love, and sacrifice on the part of them and the king and queen can save Aurora. And a lot, and while there are a lot of adventures within the story, the overall movie is still driven from scene to scene to scene by goodness and love from beginning to end, which then juxtapose the brief moments where we get to see Maleficent doing her thing, and ultimately she herself is defeated. She even says that that is going to be the downfall to the curse. She mocks it thinking she's won, but ultimately love, courage, and sacrifice win out the day, just as what was said at the beginning of the movie and is shown throughout the movie. So as we can see, by looking at something like Sleeping Beauty, there is actually a lot of wiggle room within the feel-good story formulas. You can have epicness, you can have adventures, you can have comedy and all of these things going on, but again, you want to keep it simple. Sleeping Beauty gets dangerously close to tipping towards your classic fairy tale retelling, but its constant message of goodness and love is so prevalent that it meets the feel-good criteria. Plus, you can't help but smile as the story ends because it was just so good. Other epic examples of an awesome feel-good story would include stuff like It's a Wonderful Life, Big Fish, Paddington Bear, and just so many children's books out there. Now, for the second formula, where things start off bad but eventually get better, I do have some examples that you might not have heard of, but ones that I highly recommend. But before I begin, there is a warning with this particular formula. It is very, very easy to make these stories overly morose and just filled with sadness. A sadness that is overcome with a happy cathartic ending is pretty nice, but again, catharsis alone is not a feel-good story. An excellent example to depict this is the manga In Spring, where a boy and a girl have a romantic relationship that everyone else sees as, um, transactional, to put it kindly. However, the two genuinely care for each other and seek solace in each other to escape their crappy home lives. It's sweet and it has a great ending, but so much of the story is drowned in how awful the kids' lives are that ultimately the ending is just beautiful catharsis and not necessarily a feel-good story. Now, a great contrast to that, and it's a story that always has me smiling ear to ear. I kid you not, I am always grinning whenever I read this, is the manga Kaoru Hana Wa Rin to Saku. I probably butchered it, which is why I normally call it Rintaro and Kaoruko. This manga is absolute wholesomeness and will heal even the worst heart and day. I kid you not. It follows a young man, Rintaro, who due to being bullied has convinced himself that he is not worthy of love, he isn't smart, he has no talents, and his friends just tolerate him. However, by becoming friends with the bubbly and sweet Kaoruko, 
Rintaro discovers that he is actually worthy of love. He builds up his friendships, he studies harder, and his life begins improving. Nearly every chapter will have you grinning from ear to ear as this boy's life is just made better by the goodness all around him and also with in him. It's just absolutely beautiful. I cannot recommend it enough, even if I butcher its name. <laughs> Another great story, but one that shows how how much fluff will cause a story to stop being a feel-good tale is the manga My Cry Bear My Cry Baby Divorce Neighbor. <laughs> yes, a very weird name, I will admit, but it's still great. The first arc of My Cry Baby Divorce Neighbor focuses on how the main heroine, Ochakai, emerges from the depths of depression caused by an awful divorce to become a much happier and healthier woman. Her neighbor Satawari helps her to come out of her shell by spending time with her, encouraging her to cook, complimenting her, and making new friendships, and just taking time in general to see the beauty of the world around her. By the end of the first arc, Ochakai has come so far as a person and is a completely different woman than how we met her. And you can't help but laugh and smile along her whole journey as she comes to discover that the world is so much better and so much more beautiful and that she herself is deserving of all these amazing things in her life. Now, the story does evolve into a rom-com after that, which still makes you laugh and smile, but you can feel a very big difference between the first and the second arcs, because the first arc is so much about feeling good, and it really is an uplifting tale, at least in the first arc. Remember this, too much fluff or too much of any other genre element can easily force a feel-good story to evolve like a Pokemon into something different, because a feel-good story is ultimately bare bones. I guess a good end point to this video would be to reiterate how many stories can have feel-good subplots within them. One story that has a bunch of feel-good moments in it is The Maid I Recently Hired. While predominantly a rom-com, watching how Yuri overcomes his challenge of being alone, of being an orphan, by spending quality time with Lilith is genuinely heartwarming. These little subplots of feel-goodness gives all of the ridiculous flirting a kind of depth that the story would otherwise lack, and goes from just being Shotokan cotton candy to an actually beautiful, meaningful story. And of course, if you want a good cry, if you want to feel just really good, where your soul is just healed, I would absolutely recommend reading The Dog and the Dragon from Brandon Sanderson, which is one incredible chapter in the fourth Stormlight novel. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, everyone that I've talked to about this chapter said that they shed a tear because it's such a beautiful healing chapter. Well, there you have it. The importance of feel-good stories, their basic formulas, and some fun examples of stuff to check out. Again, I Highly recommend Rentaro and Kaoruko and My Crybaby Divorce Neighbor. They are amazing manga that deserve more traffic and more eyeballs coming their way. And one other story that definitely deserves more traffic is my novel Bleed Steam and Steel. A link for that and the book is down in the description below. Shameless self plug in right there. But if you're looking for more writing advice, please uh, roam around our other videos here on our YouTube channel, or you can head on over to our podcast, Camille's Harem, found on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, The Works. We have writing exercises for you over on our Pinterest page, and we would love for you to join our growing community of novice authors. At the very least, we thank you for joining us on this adventure that we call writing, and until the next video, y'all, choose. おやすみなさいませ。<音楽>